Hello and welcome to uh, a roundtable discussion with the Reagan companies. I am Bob Tesca and I am here today with these three good looking gentlemen who've been quarantined for over 60 days and this is the first time we've actually seen people outside of our family so we're all really excited. Uh, we've got a few topics that are uh, pertinent to the current environment that we're all working in that we just kind of wanted to discuss and uh, see what shakes out. Uh, so we're going to start by taking a look at uh, bid activity. And Fran, I don't know if you want to jump in here and talk about a couple of the bullet points we have up. Sure. Thanks for having us, Bob. Um, yeah, so what we've seen since uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 um, has been uh, a, 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 a reduction in bid activity. So uh, it seems to be about a 10 or 15 percent reduction in just the number of bid bonds that our office has seen um, uh, anecdotally uh, compared to last year. Uh, what we're seeing is the trades uh, in, in projects associated with schools, uh, with, with um, road work, uh, things that, I hate to overuse the word essential, but things that are seasonal and essential uh, as you would expect. The school work has to get done in the summer. Uh, road work has to get done in the summer. So that doesn't seem to have any uh, much of an impact uh, so far. Uh, but what we have seen is a reduction uh, in the number of municipal projects, um, uh, libraries, uh, municipal town hall projects, those type of projects we've seen a, a reduction in. I'll look for the remaining 2020 and beyond is, is everyone's guess at this point. Um, we're hoping uh, it's all a lot of it has to do with the state budget and, and what kind of federal um, assistance uh, comes to the states, which is, of course, a big political um, uh, thing right now. Uh, so depending upon what happens with the federal government there, we'll, it, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, this thing steadily increase uh, the, our activity and the amount of uh, bid opportunities for Central New York, Upstate New York contractors um, over the course of the next three to four months. What I'm thinking is just my own gut instinct is that we'll see uh, continued slow opportunities here in, in the summer months, but it'll continue as we continue to open up um, government, we open up businesses that those bid opportunities will increase as we get closer to the fall. Silly season. Um, that's that's something that we uh, that I, I'm I'm really concerned, and we've been counseling our contractors is uh, really now is the time to be disciplined in terms of your bid decisions, uh, maintaining margins. There is a uh, kind of a mentality here to fill that apple cart. Uh, now, because we really don't know what's going to happen in the fall. We don't know what's going to happen next spring. Um, so there seems to be a rush in the marketplace. We're seeing um, reduced margins. We're seeing increased bidders, number of bidders on a bidder's list. Um, so what we really need to understand is uh, our contractors, understand your costs, um, understand what those margins and changes to margins will, will mean to your business, um, and, and to maintain your discipline. Yeah, I think uh, anecdotally here, Fran, across um, you know, the client base I deal with, the guys that are doing schoolwork, uh, a lot of municipality stuff, those are the guys that are busy bidding. Uh, do you have any feeling on private work? I know a lot of that's not going to be bonded, but any feeling on that as far as what the activity is there? Um, again, it's, it's, again, it's more of speculation at this point. We haven't seen a whole lot of private work in the last 60 days. Um, but th some of these projects, uh, the Amazon project, those, those things yeah. continue. So, and they need to continue. So, I think some of this, that stuff will continue. Um, I think you'll see some of that cash and some of those projects be uh, delayed um, because there's a concern about um, you know we just there is so many contractors. There's just so much labor, um, and so owners, this may not be the best time for them to build, to put those projects out on the on the, on the street. So again, I hate to be uh, so non-committal, but it really we're in, in a in a in a period where uh, it just pays to be conservative and disciplined and look for those opportunities. Um, I think you'll see in the next 30, 60, 90 days those private bid opportunities will increase. Yeah, I had on that Amazon building before it was actually announced. Amazon, I had a 
trade, specialty trade, uh, pass up on bidding the project because he was afraid that he wouldn't have enough people uh, to be able to meet the very stringent timelines that they had. And so he's the largest specialty trade in that field. And so more than likely, we're going to have someone coming in from out of the area to do that portion of the job now. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Unless they, you know, change the timeline, and perhaps they will. But you know, he passed up on it like in uh, late March, and this was just rolling. Yeah. So there, a lot of people have made that those kind of decisions. <clears throat> the problem is, it's such an onion. Uh, you keep pulling back the layers of COVID-19 and the the significant impact from supply chain, labor availability. Uh, it's, those things are unknown. Your subcontractor exposures, uh, you know, do, do they have enough uh, labor? So there are so many layers to this thing. So you really have to be uh, mindful of all those different things that could impact uh, the success of, of the project. Right. All right, shifting gears just a little bit, we're here, here from uh, Kevin and Jim. In particular, let's talk a little bit about how coverages might change uh, in relation to the pandemic. Yeah, thanks again, Bob, for having us. This is Jim McElhan, and uh, I don't really see where there's going to be any change in coverage. I think the bigger uh, thing that employers need to worry about are their posting and policy requirements uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, as people return back to work, there are certainly certain notices that have to go out to the employees for job site uh, exposure protocols, safety procedures, uh, prevention and response plan. It's the best time for you to focus on your internal policies and procedures. It, everything needs to be updated. Uh, they need to be reviewed and they need to be re-rolled out to the employees. Um, we need to look at our, our hiring practices and policies, you know, how staffing needs have changed. Uh, we need to revise our leave policies and understand, you know, how, how those have been impacted uh, as a result of COVID. So basically, we really need to take a look at what we're doing internally, all our policies, procedures, update them, and re-roll them out and educate our employees on it because doing business today is not the same as it was before. And, you know, I really can't emphasize enough that people are, are, are watching projects now like, like never before. So if you aren't following and you aren't being responsible as an employer in, in, in maintaining the best policies, practices, and procedures, you're going to, somebody's going to see it. They're going to, they're going to report it and there's going to be consequences. And those consequences uh, come with a financial penalty. And, you know, I think everybody's aware of each violation is a $2,000 up to a $2,000 fine. Uh, but there's the, there's the, the, the responsibilities employer to, to the general community to do what's right. And so if it, it, the biggest changes as I see it is going to be to follow the current CDC requirements and continue to stay up to date on it. Use all your resources, whether it's your broker, the CDC, the ABC, the AGC, any of the associations you're there's involved a lot of with. Alphabet. There, yeah, it's a lot of alphabet. But there's a lot of resources out there, and you need to make sure that you're that you're you're reaching out to them and, and and utilizing all that they have. I know what we did is is we sent out something to every single one of our clients, a toolkit, um, which had all those uh, those type of items in it. So it's it's really just doing business differently uh, to, to comply with the COVID requirements. Yeah, Bob, this is Kevin. Thanks for, for having us here today. And the only thing I would uh, add to what Jim said is, uh, again, it's not anything that's going to change required coverages necessarily, but I think policyholders are going to look at what coverages they purchase uh, potentially a little different. And that's as it relates to cyber liability as well as employment practices, liability insurance. Um, we've already seen a significant influx in cyber liability claims just based on people working remotely. Networks are easier to access uh, and, and uh, criminals can get in a lot easier. Uh, and as well as the EPLI, um, harassment, discrimination, wrongful termination, with so many people in the unemployment area right now or furloughed, there's been an influx in those claims as well. So I think folks that haven't historically purchased that coverage are gonna maybe look at that a little closer. But uh, although that's not a required coverage, it is important to, to have. All right, for the insurance ignorant, uh, what is EPLI? Employment Practices Liability Insurance. All right. <laughs> it, covers, it covers an organization for lawsuits filed by employees or third parties uh, as it relates to harassment, discrimination, wrongful termination, uh, anything along those lines. Okay. All right. All right, moving on here a little bit, we're going to, I guess, get back into me and Fran's wheelhouse of the surety world. And... Um, 
you know, I don't know, Fran, if you want to comment on how the surety industry is looking at the PPP loans. Uh, so each bonding company is kind of taking a different approach, of course, uh, depending upon um, their view of, of the PPP uh, program. Uh, most surety companies are taking a conservative view and, and have kind of treated it as a long-term asset, um, kind of a long-term liability. Uh, with that understanding from an underwriting standpoint, thinking about that PPP loan as a real positive thing for their, their um, contractors, but not necessarily giving them the full credit for the PPP loan in their working capital calculation. So um, that's a real positive thing. Um, and I think this most recent uh, guidance issued by the SBA uh, last Friday, I believe, yep. um, will ease the, con the concerns of the surety industry on, on that loan forgiveness aspect of uh, the PPP program. Yeah, I think that was very positive. Um, and it's going to open up a lot of opportunities to actually have the loan forgiven. Uh, I think I'll, I think there are a lot of people that were almost gave the loan back for fear of uh, the measurement of did we actually need the loan. Uh, when, then when they came out and said if your loan was under $2 million, we're essentially going to say that you had no access to any other capital. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to look at that part of uh, it during the loan forgiveness process, which was good. Um, if they can come out with a little more guidance on the loan forgiveness piece, I'll sleep better at night. Uh, but as of right now, at least there's enough guidance to do a calculation. Anything that comes out subsequent is only going to enhance the forgiveness and I think just put us all in a better place. Yeah, and I think that communication with the bonding company there on that exact piece of it um, is important. So, the, you know, in order to get credit for that, make sure you're maximizing the benefit of that PPP loan in terms of your capacity, uh, your buying capacity. Um, share with your surety company the uh, loan document, which uh, has the terms and conditions of the loan. Um, share with them, um, you know, your status of employment at that 75 percent of, uh, of employment. Let them know where you, you are in terms of your comfort level and um, uh, your ability to have that loan forgiven. Um, and as we get closer to that forgiveness uh, uh, date, um, once that is established, you're going to want to provide an internal financial statement of some sort uh, to, to document that it's been, uh, you know, the impact that the loan has on your balance sheet. All right. And I guess just following up on that, um, if you have guys that you, you know, ask to come back and they refuse for whatever reason, it's important that you document that by sending out a certified letter to them. And, uh, you know, in, in perfect world, they would respond to it saying, no, I'm not coming back for whatever reason. And then they're not going to go against your headcount calculation uh, when, they're, uh, when they're doing the forgiveness part related to have you maintained your headcount. Um, it doesn't help you spend the proceeds, but at least you don't get dinged for uh, not having enough people uh, back. So if you make the offer, they refuse uh, to come back, then it's as if they were there the whole time. So uh, that's important to document. I would suggest sending those letters out certified mail. That way there's some proof, even if they don't reply to it. Yeah, the, le the level of documentation uh, that you can provide, the better. Yep. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the third bullet here. Um, if sureties are going to adjust their appetites and, you know, are we looking at a hard market? I mean, it seems like to me that my dog could get a bond on the back of a napkin up until March 1st. Um, yeah, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts there? There's so much capacity uh, in the marketplace right now. I, I, I even despite the COVID-19, I don't think we'll see a hard market. There's just uh, uh, the surety industry has been so profitable um, and um, they've been responsible from an underwriting perspective for the most part. They, we haven't seen significant losses. So I, I don't anticipate a hard market. Um, I think that companies will take a closer look at that um, the liquidity of a company, they're, they're going to want uh, their contractors to maximize uh, their liquidity and working capital. They want them to, to minimize their the debt that is uh, due third parties. Um, that's always been uh, the underwriting approach from the surety perspective, but that's really going to be uh, uh, pushed uh, going into this. And, and they will take a look at much harder uh, from a subcontractor exposure for GCs who have subcontractors. Um, you know, that, that's a huge exposure to GCs. Um, uh, the, the, the supply chain is a huge exposure to all contractors. And, of course, the labor 
uh, issue is always is one that's always in the, in the forefront of the uh, surety world. So um, I think that what you'll see is um, a few more questions. Um, I think you'll continue to, to uh, you can continue to depend on the typical uh, support that you've seen. Surety industries for the most part has been good, have been good about treating each contractor individually. They don't want it. They don't typically do a huge blanket on underwriting approach. Um, so again, that, that uh, confidence that they have in the, in the consistency of your balance sheet and the, in the, uh, the makeup of your balance sheet, cash is king, of course, uh, liquidity uh, in, in debt. You know, those are the three big things you really want to, to focus on. All right. So um, let's uh, shift gears slightly here. Uh, we've talked a little bit already about the loan forgiveness, and we probably don't need to beat that one to death. Uh, and I think Fran also touched on managing the balance sheet, uh, maximizing your cash and minimizing your debt. Uh, I think that... Um, I think that can be uh, enhanced by managing your receivables, right? It's going to be important. That I think your first step in managing your receivables is getting your billing out on time. You know, you get to the, you know, make sure your payoffs are getting in, and then, you know, you need to have some procedures in house for following up on them. Because a lot of times, especially in an environment like this, the squeaky wheel is going to get the grease. And so, if you're the guy making the phone call saying, "Hey, you know, I really need to collect my receivable," and they've got, you know, X amount of dollars at the bank you're probably going to be the guy that gets it. And so I think managing your receivables is going to obviously uh, help you manage your cash. Not doing that, I think you could end up in a situation where you have a lot of receivables that are really old, which is going to hurt your surety credit. Because after 90 or so days, you know, the surety kind of cuts that out of your working capital. This is a time that uh, will expose contractors that don't have those kind of uh, consistent policies and procedures. So this is the time to really focus on your office. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, and then again, we'll shift gears here a little bit and move back to Jim and Kevin to uh, talk about some OSHA related issues. Yeah, you got you got to love OSHA. So you know, uh, with the onset of COVID, it was a recordable, and then they determined it was not a recordable. Well, hot off the presses, it's now deemed recordable again. So effective May 26 and will remain until will remain in effect until further notice all OSHA um or excuse me all COVID-19 instances are going to be recordable um so basically this affects any employer with 11 or more employees and the guidance basically states that an employer if an employer learns that an employee's COVID illness that there's really three steps that they should take they should ask the employee if they believe he or she contact, contracted the COVID-19 uh, at work, uh, they need to discuss with the employee uh, their work habits, uh, their out of work habits and activities uh, that may have led to the illness um, while understanding and respecting the employee's uh, privacy. Uh, they need to review the employee's work environment for potential risk exposure. So we still need to try and determine if this arose out of the course of work but it is now recordable. So that is a very major development, which leads me into the, you know, the next bullet point is, you know, employers really need to be prepared for an OSHA inspection, uh, you know, aside from COVID. And what we find all too often is, you know, employees, employers are great about doing their Monday morning toolbox talks, but this is a great opportunity to have a Monday morning toolbox talk about how to be prepared for an OSHA inspection. And, and I'd really like to share a couple bullet points, you know, with, with everyone because these inspections can go two ways, right? They can go very well or they can go very poorly. And if they go poorly, it's gonna result in citations, which can be uh, very detrimental to the company and it can be very costly. So number one is I would, I would always advise if OSHA shows up on the job site, is check their credentials, make sure they are who they say they are. Um, at that point, you should immediately notify management when the inspector arrives, have them sit tight, Let's get the right, the proper people with the with the OSHA inspector to to understand why they're there, and to determine what the purpose of that the scope and in, in in the uh, of the in the purpose of the inspection is. Was it a complaint? It, you know, was there an injury? These are all important things to understand as to why they're there. Be prepared to prove compliance. Make sure you have all your policies and procedures readily available. These things are going to assist you in in having that inspection go smoothly. 
If it's a complaint, get a copy of the complaint. Let's understand what, you know, again, what is the scope and the purpose of that, um, of that inspection. Set the ground rules for the inspection. You know, they're not judge and jury here. They're here to understand what the, you know, what the situation is. So let's make sure that we're, we're setting the ground rules so that this, this goes well for us. You know, you certainly want to, while I'm saying all these aggressive, what may seem like aggressive tactics, um, we still want to, you want to cooperate and make sure that we're being responsive, but let them understand that we also understand our rights as well. And then really importantly is take note of whatever the inspector documents so that after the fact, you can regroup as a company and understand what we potentially might have as exposures and what might result in an, in an ultimately in a, in a fine because you're going to need to respond to that in a very timely uh, manner. So, so um, you say check credentials. Are there stories of people posing as OSHA inspectors? It, it, absolutely. Oh. It's happened before. They actually carry a badge, if you will, no different mm -hmm. than like a trooper, and they need to show and it's a de proper identification of, of, of who they are. All right. Are you taking the last bullet, Kev? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as far as the new the new uh, workers' compensation class code, there there initially was a lot of question and confusion around. Okay, so half of our workforce is home, or half of our workforce is home being paid but idle, not working at all. Um, how do we prepare for, and what can we expect uh, for these charges to be once we get to our annual audit? And the New York State uh, Compensation Insurance Rating Board has created a new code 8873 that's gonna to apply to all employees that are now working remotely, uh, as well as employees that are home being paid but are idle, not working but still on the payroll. Uh, so this is gonna be retroactive back to March 16th, and the, the rating class, uh, the rate itself is going to mirror uh, what the clerical rate is. So it's gonna be a very low rate. Uh, it's important for anybody who carries a workers' compensation policy to track these employees on their payroll as either working remotely or being out of the office, being paid but idle. That way you can be prepared to properly have those uh, payroll amounts allocated when that audit occurs. So it, it was good that they did this. It, it answered a question mm -hmm. uh, that, a lot of, that a lot of organizations had and provided some clarity on um, internal procedures on how to track that. Nice. All right. Um, I think that's going to wrap it up. Here's our legal disclaimer. Uh, but if you do have any uh, specific questions, our contact info is on that second slide. Please feel free to reach out to any of us. And with that, uh, have a safe, separated day.